Hi everyone, I'm Sandra. I work for Wonder, and um, today I'm going to talk about um, how we've built the first voice-based parenting assistant and uh, focus on some of the lessons that, we, that we've learned and I would like to share them with you. Um, first, maybe let me talk a little bit about um, the company and myself. So here you can see me on the picture with our founder Lamont when we were at TechCrunch uh, earlier this year. Um, so we are a small company. We've started out in Hong Kong originally three years ago, and now we're based between Sydney, New York, Phoenix, and San Francisco with our education team uh, and marketing team mainly in the US and our um, engineering um, and product team in Hong Kong. Um, we've also been venture backed by uh, Hacks, uh, hardware accelerator under SOSV, uh, Johnson & Johnson, and Sanford StartX. Um, for myself, I've, uh, I've been a first employee, um, so I've been pretty intimately focused on um, users from the very beginning. I've been probably running around more than 100 user interviews for the past, uh, for the past three years. And um, uh, most recently, I've also run our internal beta, where we've recruited um, over a thousand families um, to take part in, in just our app iterations for six months. And um, right now, what we are focusing on is preparing our, um, our product, um, our assistant to, to launch. And what I'm specifically doing is focusing on how can we integrate between our mobile app, mobile app experience and the voice experience, and um, how can we add more user delight into the whole, um, into the whole use case. Um, so why did we decide to build a voice-based parenting assistant? I just wanted to briefly go over that. Um, there are two main reasons. Um, one is the science. So we have over decades of research that prove that what is the most critical for child's IQ, their school readiness, um, their long-term success, but even emotional stability is just the quality and quantity of parent-child interactions that they have uh, when they are young. So between zero to five years old, when the, when the, when the infrastructure of the brain is laid out. Um, and there are two things that we know specifically impact um, um, child's brain development. Um, and one is the word count, which means how many words you speak to your child every day. And the other one is interaction quality, which means how many back and forth engaged conversations you're having with your child. And this is a study that's specifically been done by MIT and Harvard two years ago um, that has uh, pushed that idea of, you know, you, know, you shouldn't just uh, kind of dump words on your child, you should really engage them in the interaction. Um, and so we know that um, there's no, nothing out there currently that helps parents really quantify how they're doing on these metrics. Um, and, you know, just like with a Fitbit, um, we know that doing 10,000 steps every day generally improves your overall fitness levels. Um, just like here, we also have certain scores that indicate, you know, what is the optimal level of language stimulation for a child so that they can develop properly. And um, our initial idea actually came from being able to use natural language processing and, um, you know, and, and behavioral science and, um, and basically mobile interactions to, to build such a fun tool for parents to use so that they can actually know if they're on track um, and then also recommend them certain activities that they could do uh, if they would like to interact more. Um, so that was the initial idea. Um, and it came really from the research and trying to make it more accessible to parents through um, uh, building a certain tool um, that could make it more fun. Um, but the other thing is definitely the trend, the voice trend. Um, so we actually in our company think that parents are power users of voice. So for example, multitasking. Uh, mothers that we interview, you know, they often say, I walk around the house with a baby in one hand, with a bottle in the other hand, and sometimes I just don't have time or mind space to sit down and write down certain things. Like for example, tracking how much, uh, how much food the baby had or um, diaper changes. And so usually this is done on apps or on pieces of paper. Um, but actually using just voice and being able to just say, hey, wonder, log a diaper is actually a, a big improvement for just how quick that can happen. Um, you know, we've also found that, um, that actually research by Google confirmed some of that because they've been studying how different groups of users use their Google Home Assistant. And, um, and they basically said that we found that parents are using devices more than non-parents uh, and they're also using them differently. Um, and so, and so something that we've been exploring in our user research is what are some of the problems um, that um, parents have that, that our assistant could help with. And so multitasking is one thing that I already mentioned, but there's also motivation. Um, basically life gets really busy, especially for working parents. And sometimes they just come back home and they don't really have ideas. Um, 
and then they feel guilty. Um, and something that we can do is we can actually pretty easily recommend certain activities um, and also use voice and sound to make things fun. Um, we can also use visual cues to just remind them, hey, you know, you haven't really done many interactions today by actually showing on our device um, changing levels of light. Um, I'm going to show you how it looks like in a moment. Um, but, the, but the other thing is also screen time. So basically the fact that our assistant is based on, the bo on voice and you don't really have to carry it around, you don't really have to um, use your screen around, it's very beneficial for parents who specifically want to minimize the exposure to, to blue light um, of their kids, especially when they are really young. Um, and the last thing is the guesswork. So um, there's a lot of parenting noise out there and um, we want to be a trusted source of information for parents. Uh, right now, if you just ask a Google Home or an Alexa some parenting questions, um, they are not really optimized for answering those. So they will probably just give you the first answer that they find in the search, but that is not, um, but that is not, but that does not mean that this is the right answer or that this is a research validated answer. So what we are trying to build is we are bringing in that element of very natural interaction with uh, with your voice and with the assistant, but also curating what are the what are the outcomes that we recommend, what are the information that we pass along. Um, so um, what is Wonder? Let me just um, show you how Wonder looks like. Uh, Wonder is basically this uh, smart speaker like device. Um, you can see that it fits pretty well into the baby nursery. It looks really cute. Um, and, the, and the white uh, round part, which we call the sun, which is sun behind the cloud, is, is also that part that gives visual feedback. So it lights up um, more the more you talk to your child in a day. Um, and it comes together with, uh, with the app. Uh, and this is really your hub for information. It's, it's really personalized. Everything is based on your child's developmental age and on your milestones. And you can also see uh, or track the output of certain things that you've been logging with the device. Uh, like for example, you see uh, here a, a list of logs, um, like feeding or pumping, change of diapers, um, but it can also uh, recommend you books and activities that can be both accessed through the app and, uh, and through the device. Um, I also mentioned we do have those language interaction monitoring. So we're using natural language processing and our own algorithm to monitor how many words you speak to your child and how many back and forth conversations you have, um, which we know are the key indicators of child's development. And uh, we also have that Ask Wonder um, function, which is curated, you know, FAQs around baby development that are curated by our education team. And um, the last thing is, I wonder, also comes with a night mode. So um, that means you can use it for, for sleep training. Uh, at a certain time of the day, the sun will become the moon. And then we also have night light, um, sound machine, and cry detection that, you, that a parent can trigger. Um, so this is just an overview of use cases, um, how we hope that the, our assistant can assist the parent throughout the day. Let's say in the morning, they can ask, hey, wonder, um, log a wet diaper change at 10 a.m. Um, and then Wonder would reply with a, with a kind of a sound, uh, you know, and it would log that in the app. Um, in the afternoon, we, uh, we can, you know, grab a book, grab Wonder and say, hey, Wonder, let's read a book with sound effects, which basically means that Wonder will be listening to what you're reading and um, following up with sounds that are, um, that are accurate to the storyline and make things more interactive and fun. Um, and then at night, uh, as I mentioned, you can trigger and wander into the night mode that will continue until a certain time of, um, of, the, of the morning. Um, one more thing that I wanted to mention is many, parent, many, many people ask us, why did we not just build an Alexa skill or something that works with the Google Home? Um, why did we decide to build uh, our own hardware and our own assistant uh, and our own natural language processing algorithm? Um, well, the answer is really that um, if we worked with existing providers like Amazon or Google, generally they would not give us access to the raw audio data that we're collecting to the assistant. And that means both that we wouldn't be able to use our natural language processing algorithm to actually quantify the number of words and interactions that the parent has with the child, which is one of the critical things that we're trying to do. And this is one of the key things that we've also built out together with researchers that is really unique about our product. And on the other hand, we also couldn't learn what are the things that parents are actually asking the assistant, which means you can't really optimize further. You don't know how really how your parent is engaging with this product. What are their concerns? 
questions. And it, it and, and this just means that the moment we sell the device to them, they would be, we would basically stop learning about our user. And we didn't want to do that. So even though hardware is hard, we decided to build our own assistant. And um, so far it's proven also to be a very good decision because we can be fully in control of the privacy settings as well. Um, but I'll talk about that a bit later. Okay, so let me jump to the main part of this presentation, which is really about um, how we've built it. And um, a little bit of that is bootstrapping. So I hope that for a lot of you, this might actually be helpful because we did it with very, very low budget. Um, I will also mention that we do have a person on our team who, uh, who built an assistant before. Uh, he was actually um, a person who launched uh, one of the first um, kind of intelligent um, or emotionally intelligent speakers um, on, on Kickstarter. Um, and so we definitely had that expertise in house. But the other things that followed and some of the challenges we had to face, for example, how to train the assistant, how to make it smarter, how to brand it. And so that's what I would like to share. Um, so the first thing that I would like to start with um, is you should really have clear product design principles from the start. And this is because voice is such a new technology and there's so much that we don't know about how users will be actually be interacting with your voice product that having some strong guidelines in your team helps ensure that you're building something that is ethical and that is something that you will be that you will be kind of happy you know and um that you'll be happy to share with the world and you will not worry that it will cause um that it will cause um certain Okay, so the first thing that um, I would like to say is that voice is such a new technology and we really don't know um, how users might be using that. We, we, do, we can just have a lot of assumptions about how our users will interact with our voice product. That's why having clear, um, strong product design principles from the beginning is very helpful. And I will not go into detail on those. We can talk about that later. But I think I would just like to mention them very briefly. So habit forming basically relates to making sure that we're building the right habits for the parent and that we're using the technology that's available, both in terms of mobile phone, like in-app notifications, constant feedback, as well as um, on the hardware side, on the voice side, actually being able to interact um, in some regular manner um, to build positive parenting habits. Time saving just means we understand that every moment that the parent spends on the phone, on our app, means that they're not spending their time with their child. And that's why we want to make sure that we give them the right information at the right time so that they can minimize the time that they spend with our product and maximize the time that they spend with their child interacting. Um, modularity is really important because we cater to parents who have children between zero to five years old. And basically the needs of a parent change around every three months. So this is really critical that we can, we can kind of, you know, drag and drop certain parts of our solution, of our content, especially if the recommendations that we give uh, based on where the parent is at right now, where their child is at. Um, so building it in a way that can be customized um, it has been really important for us. Um, Evidence-based, so as I've mentioned, our algorithm has been developed with researchers and anything that we recommend is validated by science. That's why we, as a, te as a technology company, we also have a very strong education team and um, basically our hardware, our AI team is working with the education team very closely to make sure that the product is actually um, following what we know from education to be, um, to be effective. Um, and privacy first is a strong decision that we made um, from the beginning. It is also because we have parents on our team who understand how important privacy is for parents. Um, and that means, um, for example, uh, our device, you know, our assistant could actually be monitoring your interactions with the child for the entire day but we are not going to do this. We decided to give control to the, to the user. This has also been hugely beneficial for us when we just started out around 2018, 2019, in interviewing parents and showing them the prototype of the device. Um, and just that ability to be able to control when you record things by saying, hey, wonder, has been a factor that gained us a lot of trust from the user. Um, so how did we train it? Um, that's the fun part actually, and I would really recommend to involve your users in it and make it fun. So what I wanted to show you here is on the left, you can see the email that we've sent um, to our, like some of our wait list basically around December, where we just um, framed it as, you know, we need your help. We want you to be a part of it. We want you to help us co-create this, this cool new product. And uh, we basically offer them a discount um, that they will get when we launch the device. And we just also made it about the enthusiasm about being a part of the journey. 
And uh, we've got a pretty good conversion rate, uh, around 30% of parents who reached out to replied back. Um, and that means we've had around 16 parents who filled in the survey, which took around 10 minutes. And um, what that means is that with zero budget, basically, we got around 80 different variations for each intent. An intent here means something you can ask Wonder to do, let's say log a dirty diaper. Um, and so here's how it would look like for the parent in the survey. Um, you know, something that we've learned is that there, there, there are almost a hundred ways to, to log a diaper. And this is something critical because you want your assistant to understand different types of expressions. So be it, be it a parent says, I changed the diaper and then assistant should ask, okay, was it dirty or clean? Um, or they can just say, you know, record a dirty diaper. And so there are many, many ways in which that could happen. And um, that was a great exercise for us to basically get that first training data in for basically no money. Um, the other thing is giving it personality. And here uh, my tip would be to really make it visual and involve your internal team. So what we did is, um, I don't know if you're familiar with, the, uh, with Google Ventures um, three hour uh, brand sprint, um, but this is something that, that was helpful for us um, using some of uh, personality sliders. We had an internal survey that went around before the workshop where we basically asked people in our team, how do you imagine um, the personality of, of our wonder assistant is? And we also asked them to find pictures. And so what you can see here is um, the variety of, of inspirations that people had, which was super interesting. Anything from a super nanny that's a bit more like authoritative and you know loud um, to, to like a doula type um, person that's very caring and it's just like assisting the mother. We even had Baymax, uh, which is a pretty um, personality less, you might say, or maybe faceless um, creature that is just basically kind of like a chip on your shoulder and just um, giving you information. And we even had, you know, mother nature as one of the inspirations. And so from all of this, I think we were able to come up with, um, with the idea that we really want this assistant to be, um, to have a more female personality and to be, to be both kind of wise and warm, you know, teaching, guiding, uh, but also um, approachable. So it's not just kind of like someone, you know, who is like an authority and you can't really talk to them. It's, it's someone who you can both talk to and who relates to you, but also who has a lot of knowledge about child education. Um, and then we decided we have to give them voice. And that has been actually very helpful. Um, or, or this process has been helped by the fact that I've attended the Voice, the Voice Global Conference last year, where I took part in the Sonic Branding Workshop. And Sonic Branding is, again, a word I will not go deep into here. It's a, it's a huge new field of study, and um, you, can, you can kind of check it out on your own. But basically what it means is that you have to figure out what your brand is and then match that with the right type of voice or sounds or even sound logos. So something that... Um, you will need to figure out is your acoustic measures of voice, like intensity, intonation, frequency, pace, and quality. And, and, and two other things that have been really important to us is figuring out what the accent should be. So mainly, um, you know, American or British. And we've been finding through talking to parents and actually playing them the samples that that American accent is something that they prefer, probably because they're based in the US and that's just more relatable. Um, and gender, as I've mentioned, we've already decided it will be a more female um, sounding assistant rather than a male one. Um, the, the other thing that we did is we also set up um, interviews with some of our you know, early waitlist users um, in their homes. So in January, um, myself and three other team members, we, we basically committed one week to just doing that. We've set up um, five different interviews across uh, San Francisco and the Bay Area. Um, and we basically capped that in three days uh, where the main thing that we wanted to learn is really how do parents currently use other devices? Um, wh where would they place our device at home? Um, because we weren't actually sure whether that would be a living room or a nursery, and that could actually impact how they use our product. Um, and also we wanted to um, basically have them interact with the early prototype. So we had a prototype, very scrappy, just um, just um, a kind of a case um, or, the, or, or like an empty form factor of our, of our wonder uh, connected to a, um, to a computer where the assistant was hosted. Um, and we basically had parents interact with it back and forth a little bit. Um, and this was hugely, hugely important. I think, um, you know, for two main reasons uh, around the product, which is 
where would they place it? And we definitely found out that it would be the nursery where they would place it. Um, and the other thing is uh, for, for the voice of the assistant itself, they, they clearly wanted it to be a bit more uh, paced, you know, like to have more pauses um, to, for example, when you're reading out an activity idea where you're trying to guide the user through, through certain um, actions that they should do, introduce some pauses, um, allow the parent to maybe ask to repeat again rather than just kind of read it out. And, you know, this is something that sounds obvious right now, but it really wasn't before we started testing and before we actually saw how um, similarly parents react in terms of what they would expect. Um, so that gave us a lot of confidence in making those decisions. Like, for example, considering um, having a more robotic or more kind of, you know, plain voice to just um, do some sort of confirmation statements like, oh, okay, I've logged you know, X versus a voice that actually reads out activities that's supposed to be a bit more engaging and actually would benefit from us having an actor read it out. Um, and um, the last thing is that we were all, we also got much more clear about what is valuable and what is not. So how should we prioritize our roadmap? Um, and again, because the assistant can do so many things um, and we actually want it to be kind of an all-in-one hub for all things parenting, um, sometimes it's hard for us to know which things you should prioritize. But user interviews with your real you know, users actually give you the ability to see their emotional reaction to things. So we were able to see how excited they were about the idea of logging things without using your phone, just saying things out and then being logged because logging is such a tedious everyday task for the first, you know, three to five months of your child's life. Um, another thing we found out is also sharing um, the app with uh, a partner or a nanny uh, is actually something that is really important for parents and also something that they have paid for before. So that offers us as a company this, um, this guidance as to what are the features that could be monetizable as well. Um, and something that we also found out is that they were not really excited about the idea of adding a camera to Wonder or, um, or kind of like a walkie-talkie two-way two -way talk with the baby. Um, and this is great because these are both very difficult features to build and um, this, um, this helped us to narrow down and kind of focus our roadmap. And the last thing that I would like to talk about is really the interactions between the voice interface and mobile interface. Um, and this is super interesting because even though voice has been getting so much um, good press recently, and it's um, and it's and it really is a new interface rather than just a product. I mean, it really is just a new way to interact with technology and get certain things done faster and easier. But also, um, voice will not replace mobile. Um, and there are certain things that mobile is still better at, like, for example, giving your parents some information, um, giving them time to sit and reflect and look back at some things that they've done, some summaries, reports about the child. Um, some of these things are much more um, better, like much better retained when they're actually visual. Um, and again, that can also be a hub for parents to gather in one space and, and kind of track child development. Um, so in one, in one way, we are trying to offer um, the same abilities on both the assistant and on the app. Um, and for example, that's important with logging. That's again, something we've learned from our users because maybe initially we were just like, okay, let's just offer voice logging. I mean, it's easier, but at the same time, many parents pointed out, you know, there are situations when I will not be able to use the assistant uh, where it might, you know, not have power suddenly, or maybe I'm outside of the house and I want to log something that I've done half an hour ago. Uh, and this is when the app should also have this ability to, um, to log a nap, let's say, um, just like you can on the, on the assistant. Um, or sometimes you might just not want to wake up the baby. So you don't want to talk to the assistant. You want to do it on your phone. Um, so yeah, so basically one way um, to bridge is to offer the same capability, both on voice and on mobile. Um, in another way, um, we also offer different capabilities on both of them because one of them is better suited for that than the other. And so for example, for... Um, for the assistant specifically, um, let's say you're, you know, you're in the kitchen, you're cooking something or chopping vegetables and your child is there with you and you want to get some activity idea to engage your child with in some talk. And so you can just shout out, you know, hey, Wonder, give me a lunchtime activity. Um, and, that's, uh, and that's really easy. You don't have to stop, you don't have to do anything, you have to reach for your phone, your dirty fingers, you can just hear it out and start playing. Um, on the other hand, if you want to look back at how many words you've spoken in that interaction, um, how is that compared to yesterday, um, or you want to get um, some more um, kind of deeper long-term trends as to how you've been doing over weeks or months um, to get motivation, this is something that would be harder to deliver via voice. You could basically 
ask the assistant to tell you what that is. But these are some of the these are some of the types of information that we retain better if we can actually see them and we can see a you know a chart that actually shows you how you've been doing maybe across different days or different weeks and so um and 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 in that way that's more motivating than hearing out what the trend has been um so that's so these are some of the things that we use differently um and then um the app uh, interface is also a great way to personalize the assistant and also to um, to teach the user how to how to use it because as we've talked about um, that earlier a voice is still very new and some parents actually are not aware of all the possibilities that it could have and so what we are doing is on one hand when you get on board you set up your assistant you can personalize a lot of things like for example you see on the left your night mode so you can choose if you want it at all do you want it to be triggered at a specific time do you want it to have sound machine, um, night light, cry detection? Um, so you can do all of that on your app so that later the assistant is just already there. It works for you for your routine. Um, and then in the middle, you can see that we also have these cards um, on our app that, uh, that give you ideas of what are the different things Wonder can do for you. Because the interesting thing we found is that um, you know, if you tell parents Wonder can do this, 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 and also you can ask it any question, um, it will actually take some time for parents to realize what are the types of questions that you that they can ask. And also what are the types of questions that will not be answered because it's not like your Google Home that can tell you answer to anything. It is really parenting oriented. So we basically just straight away give them these ideas so every day they can learn a new thing they can do with Wonder. And on the right, you can see, we also decided to include a conversation history on the app. Um, and this is really just an output of things that you have asked um, Wonder today. And um, why is this important, especially at this early stage of launching our product, is because we cannot foresee the things that Wonder will not be able to do or where technology will basically fail us. Maybe this could also mean parent has a strong accent, even though they speak in English, and the Wonder will just not be able to understand some of the things they want. And so it is important for the parent to be able to look back and actually see what Wonder recorded, because maybe it didn't really deliver what the parent wanted. So then it would be a really important step towards parental understanding of like, yeah, it's not that this product is useless, it's just that misunderstood me. And we think that this will actually be pretty important. Another thing is, if you can ask a question about child's development and you're going to hear an answer, you might actually want to go back and read it again. Um, and so that would be also a place where you would be able to access what is the, actually the thing that Wonder told you. So these are some of the lessons that I wanted to share. And what's next for us is um, a very exciting period. Um, we are launching Wonder this summer, finally. So, um, so we are just in the last stages of um, finalizing the user experience on the app, uh, testing it a lot with parents. Um, and on the other hand, we are training the assistant with all of these intents that we got from the survey. And we're fine tuning the voice based on, um, based on the results of our, um, of our internal branding workshop. And so after we launch Wonder, that will be the critical time to both listen to the users, so really to validate the assumptions that we've had about how parents will use the assistant, when and for what. Um, and um, on the other hand, we'll be getting a lot of audio data. So we'll be able to get more and more versions of different, um, of different ways you could ask certain things uh, of Wonder. And also for our natural language processing algorithm, we will gather a lot of data of just parents and babies interacting so that we can fine tune the way we calculate words and conversations. Um, based on all of this, based on talking to our users, based on actually seeing how they use Wonder and, um, and improving the accuracy, we'll then be able to build up new features. And um, all of that is really focused on making it more interactive and smarter. So some of the things I'm really personally interested in and excited about is on one hand, allowing parents to log things like milestones. So let's say you can tell Wonder, hey Wonder, I just saw my baby smile for the first time. So not only Wonder should be able to log that as a precious moment and maybe save it you know, on a timeline somewhere, um, but also it will be able to actually check that off on the developmental checklist. Um, which will then trigger a better activity personalization because we know what the child can already do versus what they cannot do. 
Um, so that's one. Um, another thing that I'm really interested in, and that's also where the, the kind of more human nature of voice products comes in, is being able to provide parents with mental health support. Um, we know that postpartum depression is a huge problem. And we, we think that actually the, after we've, we, we validate this assumption that parents trust wonder and that it becomes a part of their home, of their family, of their child's development, then we should be able to connect parents with um, some expert sort of coaching or even some sort of therapeutical support through voice where they would be able to access some, some motivation, some supportive statements, or where they would be able to maybe connect even with, uh, with some experts um, um, or even just listen to podcasts about parenting. And so these are all the different things where we can see our roadmap going, basically providing smarter, uh, more um, kind of um, time-based and timely advice to parents that is really responding to not just their child's development and helping the child improve, but also for the parent to reduce their stress and feel more motivated and feel more reassured. Um, so just to summarize some of the key takeaways that I have for all of you thinking about building an assistant or building assistance, um, I think that first of all, I really want to emphasize that fact of you as a company, as a builder, have responsibility. Uh, because voice is a new technology and we don't really know how um, how it can be used or misused. We have some assumptions. So um, it's better to err on the safe side and actually have principles in your product design um, guidelines where you specify what, what matters to you and what outcomes you're going after. So for example, to be evidence-based or to be privacy first. And that and communicating those will actually gain you a lot of trust from your early users who will want to join you on this journey on helping build it out. Um, and that tends to the second point, which is engage your user. Um, make sure that you have this group of, you know, 10 users you know you can always reach out to, you can always ask them for some feedback, send them over a folder with some sound samples and just ask them, hey, what do you think about that? What do you prefer? Um, and just make it fun for them. Know that they are co-creating something that is very new and exciting. Um, then I would also engage your team, your internal team, because they have very usually they have very good understanding of how they envision this assistant would look like they know what the problems of the users are they know what's available and it can be really fun to just brainstorm different personality types and different um, even visual ideas of how how let's say your assistant would look like as a person and there's also a movie called her which you might watch as a team before that um, and um, and yeah, and then just um, and then just try to think up what 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 is that brand statement? What what is this feeling that this assistant should give to the parent? Um, the fourth one is um, definitely take out your early prototype, even if it's scrappy. Um, but as long as it can talk and it can do something, just take it out uh, out of your office, take it to the user's home, um, see where they would like to interact with it. What is the context of that? You know, is it close to the TV? Would it be too loud for the assistant to to catch it? Um, and also, how do they feel about the voice and the sounds? Um, this, this can be hugely, hugely informative and can really also cut down the time that you spend on building features that might not be actually desirable. Um, and the last thing is that voice is a very, very interesting and exciting new interface. It can help you do a lot of new things that were not possible before, or maybe that are just much more easier with voice. But don't also forget about mobile. And I think the, the user delight factor is really in the interactions between the voice and the mobile. Because voice is more real time, happening kind of right now on the spot, and mobile is a bit more reflective, kind of big picture, um, some sort of personalization. And so, so both of these can actually work really well together, especially for a type of product like this, um, a platform that kind of evolves with you. So I think these are the main things that I wanted to share today. Um, um, if you have any more questions, feedback, just send me an email. You can also um, sign up to our waitlist on hellowonder.com and follow us on different social media channels at hello underscore wonder. Um, and I will be here to take some questions on, um, on the Q&A as well. Thank you.